Hi everyone, Sane Man here. This video is brought to you by a donation from New Alberta Separatist, and here's what he has to say. Hello from Calgary, Alberta. I stumbled upon your channel after researching MGTOW, and I'm intrigued by the movement. In particular, I notice how often you speak from a Canadian perspective, although your experiences seem very Toronto-centric. In Calgary, we are behind the curve when it comes to MGTOW, and even though recent changes in Alberta may suggest the movement may catch on, I believe it will not become as ubiquitous here as it is in Toronto. In Alberta, our instinctively volatile economy, a harsher climate than in Toronto, and one of the most disadvantageous geographic positionings in the planet make it very difficult for anyone to truly go their own way. Alberta has always been and will always be a masculine province and that has created a culture more conducive towards traditional male-female relationships. That said, I believe the implications of MGTOW, particularly the destructive nature of third-wave feminism, may have some indirect consequence that could lead to the breakup of Canada as a nation. Canadian unity since the Quebecois separatist referendum of 1995 has been maintained by two industries, Ontario Manufacturing and Alberta Oil Sands. Both industries generated the excess capital capable of paying for the social welfare programs that placate the Quebecois, effectively killing the Quebec separatist movement. Unfortunately, under the progressive feminist government of Kathleen Wynne, Ontario's economy has been so badly mismanaged that its manufacturing industry could not keep paying into the equalization system. Ontario is now a have-not recipient of federal welfare, not a payer into it. This means that the burden of paying for Canadian unity lies squarely on the shoulders of the Alberta oil sands, an industry I have heard progressive feminists and environmentalists describe as the epitome of toxic masculinity. In Alberta, our current premier, Rachel Notley, was by and large elected by freeloading progressives from across Canada, moving into the province looking for easy money during the height of our oil sands boom. Notley fluked her way into office as the oil boom ended, and she has since adopted the same feminist social and economic policy as Ontario's Kathleen Wynne, much to the approval of our feminist prime minister, Justin Trudeau. It is quite evident that Rachel Notley will do to the Alberta oil sands what Kathleen Wynne has done to Ontario manufacturing, bring it to its knees. With the two drivers of the Canadian economy in ruins, who will pay for the equalization payments and keep the Quebecois separatists in check? Simultaneously, the Trudeau government will likely double on equalization to extract as much wealth from Alberta as it can in the face of mass aging crises in both Ontario and Quebec. When he does, that will further exacerbate the economic stagnation in Alberta and reignite the long-standing Western separatist movement as well that the Federal Conservative Party tapped into as its power base. Whether it's Quebec or Alberta, Canada is facing a serious existential threat almost perfectly coinciding with the takeover by progressive, third-wave feminists of the federal government and the governments of the only two provinces that have the actual financial resources to hold Canada together. I wrote on my blog describing why the end of Canada is inevitable, and I'm curious and I want to hear your thoughts on this particular matter. Thanks. Well, new Alberta separatist, thanks for the donation as well as the topic request. I put a link to your blog in the first link in the description. You ask who will be paying to keep Quebec separatists in check when the government finally can't afford to send Quebec its welfare check each and every single month. For all the Americans and other outsiders listening, Quebec is the French-speaking province that requires a bribe from the Canadian government constantly or it's going to basically threaten to go its own way. So how will Canada keep Quebec? Why, with debt creation, of course. They will simply print or borrow more money and hand it over to the francophones in Quebec to bribe them into staying. They will kick the can down the road until the country goes bankrupt. With regards to manufacturing, it has been declining for a really long time in Ontario. Just look at places like Windsor, St. Catharines, and Niagara Falls. But this was happening a long time before Kathleen Wynne, our lesbian feminist overlord, was around. She's also now taxing the province to death with carbon taxes selling off our electricity system to private companies, and doing all kinds of other things. Our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, or Skippy, as Bernard Chapin likes to call him, is trying to get a national carbon tax going. You're right, New Alberta separatists, that Ontario became a have-not province. But it's in better shape than Alberta because of our fire sector. Fire stands for finance, insurance, and real estate. Alberta is mostly a one-trick pony where people hang fake balls on the backs of their trucks and they produce millions of barrels of oil for Canadians and Americans to consume each and every single day. I also agree with you that Alberta is more traditional and rural than urban Toronto and most of Ontario. It's more masculine because men are working in energy production. I also don't think it's that hard for men to go their own way in Alberta, especially considering the higher salaries they have for the last 10 to 15 years. But men in Alberta with simple blue-collar jobs in the energy patch driving around trucks 
have had it very easy and have been able to support families doing what they're doing. In Ontario, on the other hand, manufacturing jobs are vanishing, but our residential construction is making up the difference and keeping men masculine by putting up fake bricks and shingles. When Ontario's economy falls due to a real estate crash, that's when the real trouble starts. But now let me get into this idea that Canada will simply fall apart at some point. If Quebec ever leaves, it will lose the language it's so desperately been trying to protect all this time. If the rest of Canada no longer has Quebec in it, then Canada will drop French as an official language, and suddenly people in Quebec will have to do business with the rest of the world, and specifically North America, using primarily English. There goes their language and culture that they sought so hard to protect. If I were in charge, I would give them autonomy, but not independence. I also wouldn't be against the rest of Canada joining the United States if Quebec ever separates. Our cultures are very similar, but I don't think that's going to happen. Traveling from the United States to Canada and back is really easy, and there's usually very little border checks, and culturally both countries are very similar. With regards to Canadian women, the ones that are mostly traditional come from most of Quebec and Alberta, and the other provinces except for Ontario. In Ontario, the feminists rule this place, and a lot of it has to do with the government giving women a lot of affirmative action jobs. Ontario has the national capital, Ottawa, and there are also huge numbers of women employed there as well. Then Toronto is the provincial capital, and women here get tons of government jobs here as well. Men are certainly less employed in Ontario thanks to the demise of the manufacturing sector. And as a result, women here often have higher salaries than men do. Just go on Tinder in Toronto and you'll see that many of the women here are working as professors, teachers, and other government jobs. And yet they still can't seem to find a man that makes more money than they do, usually over $100,000 a year at these types of jobs. With regards to our illustrious leader, Kathleen Wynne, just to show what a terrible human being she is, I put a link to an article called The Heartbreaking Sex Ed Premier Wynne Gave to Her Own Children, where the author discusses how Kathleen Wynne left her husband of 13 years and caused chaos in the lives of their three kids when she started a homosexual relationship with her partner, Jane Rottenwhite. Here's a quote from a book that discussed what happened between her and her best friend, Jane, and I quote, It was during a group therapy organized by Wynne that she finally realized she had feelings for a woman in the group who she had a crush on. It was during a weekend getaway with her best friend Jane Rontwait to examine a cottage the family wanted to purchase that Wynne began a homosexual affair, breaking her marriage vow to Phil. After the weekend at the cottage, she moved in with this woman, while her husband moved down to the basement. To the adults, this made sense, the author writes, but the three little children whose lives were being turned upside down, it didn't. The children were confused by this new arrangement and quickly became miserable. Jesse, who was nine, and Christopher, who was eleven, were livid. Maggie, who was just six years old, remembers feeling sad. They were not happy. The world as they knew it had changed forever, and it happened quickly. Almost in the same breath, the children learned that their parents were splitting up and that their mother had a new partner, a woman, the author writes. The transition especially affected the eldest, Christopher. In the midst of the family experiment, Christopher began questioning his own sexuality, eventually declaring that he was gay when he went to university. Christopher now sees that his parents' experiment made him insecure in his own sexuality. He hated telling people about his family and despised his dad for not being a strong man. To expose how our family was different also made me think about how I was actually different from my friends, he said. The children were embarrassed to have the new woman in the house, telling visiting friends that she was a cleaning lady, unquote. So there you have it, folks. Now you know the type of person that's running the province of Ontario. And the worst part is people actually voted her in. Not me, though, because I voted for the Conservative Party, but it doesn't matter because this is now the crazy world we live in. To think that the courts gave Wynne the custody of the children after she ran off with her lesbian lover just shows me how messed up things are in this country. The terrible thing is that Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario, the three most populous provinces in English-speaking Canada, are now run by women. Our Prime Minister is a male mangina feminist, former substitute drama teacher. The government debt is getting worse and worse, and they don't care because they keep increasing the salaries of the civil servants until things break down, and then we're all pooched. But I see hope as men like Kevin O'Leary probably come into Canadian politics in the next few years. The pendulum has swung to the left, and now it's probably going to swing back to the right. I really think there's hope that O'Leary is going to become our version of Donald Trump and drain our Canadian swamp full of politicians and their furry feminist beavers. The reason so many feminist left-leaning politicians exist in Canada is because we have the natural resources, and we also used to have the manufacturing surplus resources to support all the mooching, and apparently salaries in Canada are going up and Americans are coming to Canada to find work over the last five or six years. Because Canadians have higher salaries than Americans. Who would have thunk it? 
I don't know why this is happening, but I think a lot of it has to do with the rising real estate prices and because of the rising oil prices and other natural resource prices since 2008. At some point, real estate is going to fall just like oil prices have, and then Canada is in big trouble. Then women will wonder where all the money went in this country, and then divorces will probably spike up because women ruin families once their finances are ruined. As for Quebec, one of the two potential separatist provinces, I love the fact that you can actually live with the woman common law there and break up with her and not actually have to pay any alimony. In other provinces like British Columbia, simply living with the woman almost immediately classifies you as being married. In places like Ontario, it often takes three years for that to kick in if you don't have kids. Then it only takes a year. In Quebec, even if you have kids and you aren't married, you're not liable for alimony. I say let's adopt the French language in the rest of Canada as well as the common laws and then things might actually improve for men and we won't need to split up the country. Anyways, that's all I've got to say for today. Thanks again New Alberta Separatist for the donation as well as your topic. I honestly don't think that Canada is going to split up anytime soon. Also don't forget to check out the MGTOW mystery link and also please give this video a thumbs up. As for everyone else out there, please follow me on Twitter or like me on Facebook to get tomorrow's video today. Thanks for taking your daily dose of red pills. And remember, a red pill a day keeps the Canadian manginas away. So enjoy the rest of your day, and cheers.